Welcome to this new appointment of the Rome Joint Astrophysics Colloquium, which is uh, jointly organized by the University of Rome Tor Vergata, the Rome Observatory, and uh, EAPS of the National Institute for Astrophysics. Uh, today is our great pleasure to have uh, as colloquium speaker Jelko Ivacic, um, as you probably know, started his uh, academic career in Croatia and then moved to the University of Kentucky for his PhD, where he worked on the dust transfer radiative models. And um, then another important cornerstone in his career has been the period at Princeton, where he had the opportunity to work on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And after that, in 2004, he took up a professorship position at, uh, at the University of Washington, Seattle, where he works still now. And um, as you probably know, he has been serving as a project scientist uh, and the chair of the project science team of the uh, Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And I understand he has been appointed back in January um, director of the Vera Rubin Observatory construction. So congratulations and best of luck with that. Uh, so today we really look forward to hear more about this um, fascinating new venture that is about to start. And I leave definitely the word to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Marina, for this very kind introduction. Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start, I just want to point out that there is a link on this front page, ls.str22. It's a randomly generated URL shortener where all these slides are available if you want to download them later so you don't have to write down or do any other recording. So I split my talk into three logical parts. I'll first just introduce briefly Rubin Observatory and Legacy Server Space and Time. Most of my talk will be giving you a status update on this construction progress. Basically, I want to convince you that very soon we will have completed observatory and will start observations. And then you as an astronomer will have a number of steps to do to prepare yourself to be an efficient and effective user of LSST data. And I'll just tell you a few dates and few slides at the end of my talk. So just to, to get this confusion with the name out, we used to be called Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST. And then about two years ago, we changed the name of the observatory to be Vera C. Rubin Observatory after Vera Rubin of dark matter fame and rotation curves in galaxies. And the project, the first project, the first survey that we'll undertake with that observatory will be called Legacy Survey of space and time LSSD. So the building, the people, the instruments, that's Rubin Observatory, but the data set, those images that I'll be talking about and data products, that's called LSSD. So first question you can ask yourself is, what's so special about LSSD? How does it compare to other leading edge projects in astronomy? And here I'm limiting myself intentionally just to optical astronomy or optical near infrared astronomy. As you know, there are two successors to HST, to Hubble Space Telescope. One is James Webb Space Telescope that was just recently launched and got news coverage all around the world. So James WST is trying to outdo HST, to outdo Hubble by having a bigger mirror. So instead of 2.4 meters, it will have 6.5 meter mirror. So it will be much more sensitive per unit time. On the other hand, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will have a mirror which is almost identical in diameter to HST, but its selling point is a very large field of view. It will have 100 times larger field of view than HST. So it will open space-based survey astronomy. And then on the ground, we have these three giant telescopes, one being led, the largest one is being led by Europe, and then there are two international telescopes that are dominated by U.S. institutions. And then finally, we have Rubin Observatory that looks teeny tiny on this diagram. So what's a big deal about Rubin? How do we get to be on this slide with all these other giants? 
Well, the reason why Rubin Observatory is so special is, although it will not have the largest mirror, it will have a very large field of view, one of the largest, unusually large for eight meter class telescope. And if you want to survey the sky, then the speed of your surveying, how long does it take you to cover the sky, is proportional to the product of the mirror size and the field of view size. And that's where Rubin Observatory is at least 100 times larger than any of these other ground-based telescopes. That's why we can deliver LSST, and I'll explain in a minute what LSST is, we can deliver LSST in about 10 years, while any other similar telescope, like for example, Gemini, would take 1,000 years. So that's the trick. That's the main reason why Rubin is special. And it's designed that way. So it's, it's designed to be able to deliver LSST in a reasonable amount of time that was set to 10 years, not 1,000 years. So when you look at our science drivers, we have a set of science drivers that together imply that we want to cover the whole sky to about 27th magnitude in many bands, and we want to also to do it in many observations. So when you sum over all bands, it will be close to 1,000 times. To do that, your budget for one observation is under a minute. Basically, each of these red circles on the sky is about 40 second total visit to that part of the sky, which includes 30 second exposure and then readout time and slowing. And so with this large field of view, we can cover 10,000 square degrees per night to a depth that is about two magnitudes deeper than SDSS, for example. And then over 10 years, we'll do it close to 2,000 times. And so we'll, we'll go another three magnitudes deeper than SDSS. So roughly speaking, SDSS went to 22. We will go with each individual visit to 24. And then when you quit, data will go to 27 magnitude in, in our band. That's the basic story behind the system. The reason why we can have such a large field of view, and here is comparison between LSST and Gemini. So you can see that it's very unusually large field of view. It's 10 square degrees or seven full moon across. And of course, when you take Nyquist sample of atmospheric seeing, you also get humongous number of pixels, and I'll show you some slides later. So we have this giant field of view, and then obvious question is, how come that we don't have image distortions that would prevent us from doing, for example, weak cleansing of galaxies? And the uh, reason is a special optical design that includes three rather than two mirrors. So if you look at the bottom on the left side, that annulus, outer annulus, is our primary mirror. And what's on top is our secondary mirror. And then we have another mirror called M3, tertiary mirror, in the middle of primary mirror. Indeed, primary and tertiary mirror are produced from a single piece of glass. It was obtained by spin casting in Arizona Mirror Lab at the University of Arizona. And you, then you just need to polish inner part M3 to get optical figure. And then you can see three optical elements. The biggest one is the largest lens ever produced. It's larger than, for example, Yerkes telescope that we know from textbooks was for many years the largest refractor in the world. And then the camera itself sits in the middle of M2 at the top. It's not shown, but you'll see some, some uh, images later. So the reason why at the same time we can have giant field of view and maintain image quality required by Recleansing is this novel Paul Baker design. And here is the mirror when it was completed at Mirror Lab at the University of Arizona. You can see clearly the boundary between the outer annulus, which is primary mirror, and the inner part, the tertiary mirror that has different optical figure. It's a very fast system. It's about F1.2 or so. So as I said, we designed this system from scratch. And in the design, we were led by several science teams. So this is not statement that these are the only 
science programs that you can undertake with our data set that we plan to obtain, but rather these were selected, of course, for probability of funding, but also for providing technical constraints on the system. For example, cosmology provided constraints on the minimum area on the sky and depth. Time domain and solar system structure studies provided constraints on how should we sample in time. Photometric redshifts of galaxies and stellar astrophysics provided constraints on which filter complement we need to have, how precise astrometry we need to get, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what's very unique about LSST, about Rubin Observatory design and, and LSST as a result, is that we will not have time allocation committee. We will not split our observing time into smaller parts, and then each of these science teams will have, say, 25% of time. Instead, we demonstrated that with our design, the same data set can accomplish all these science programs. So it will be a single data set. 90% of our time will be scheduled automatically using a software algorithm. So that's a key point about LSST. I will not go in any deeper into, into scientific drivers, because it, you can find them easily in this paper linked in the upper right, LOP, LSST overview paper. I will instead now focus on describing the system itself. So to summarize this scientific introduction, as a result of our science drivers, we ended up with LSST survey, and the principle is quite simple. So most of time will be spent on scanning the sky twice per night because we want to detect motion of solar system objects of asteroids so that we can easily find them. So with the design that we have, we can cover the sky every three to four nights. And so that translates to about close to 1,000 times. The, the requirement is 825 visits over 10 years. And that's why we call it digital color movie of the sky, because you will see what is changing on the sky. After 10 years of observations, this will come to about 100 petabytes of imaging data, or in terms of 16 megapixel images, like what you have on your phone, probably, it's of the order of billion such images. And simulations show that they're normalized with existing data in smaller areas that already go deep enough. Simulations show that we'll have about 20 billion galaxies and about 20 billion stars in our sample. And the sky coverage for the existing baseline is shown in the bottom left, where the green area is southern sky in equatorial coordinates. That's eight of projection. So this greenish is about 880 observations. And then purple is fewer observations, but still hundreds of observations. And that's designed to cover the galactic plane to enable galactic studies. And then top left crescent is the northern part of the ecliptic designed to cover essentially 360 degrees of the solar system ecliptic. So again, we'll go about five magnitudes deeper than SDSS, and it will be done over roughly half of the sky. And here is an example of how we would observe. This is our simulation of cadence. So there is an algorithm that asks that compares basically cost function and benefit function. So for each observation, you can compare it to the idealized observation. And that comparison, for example, immediately leads you to choose red filters if the moon is up, for example, and prefer, gives preference to blue filters when there is no full moon nearby. You can see moon coming in as the big dark circle. So the red lines are ecliptic and and the uh, galactic plane and the roughly circle in the middle in the, the black line that's the horizon from Cerro Pachon in Chile and so for each of these observations the the algorithm says where is the nearest field that I really need to observe at this moment and so each of these jumps of this of this position of this um, bore site corresponds in real time to 40 seconds. So it's 30 second exposure with slowing and readout, with two readouts, then it becomes 
close to 40 seconds. And so there is no human intervention. This goes on and on and on each night. It has database of previous observations. It has weighting between bands, weighting across the sky, and depending on weather, on seeing and the position of the moon, it decides what to do. So here is an example of image of sky, tiny image. It's only three arc minutes across. It's one tenth of the full moon's diameter. It's GRI composite from SDSS. It goes to roughly 22nd magnitude. And the same part of the sky was imaged by the Subaru HSC survey to roughly the same depth as we expect from LSST. And here is the comparison. So flipping between these two is the best summary of what LSST will mean for astronomy. So going from something that is still gold standard as the SS survey, we will go to something like this. Uh, obviously, as we go deeper in astronomy, we detect many more objects per unit area. And this is the reason why we will have 40 billion objects in LSST. That will be for the first time that astronomers will have cataloged more objects than they are living people on Earth. So it never happened that we had more objects. We'll have 40 billion. You could literally name star and a galaxy after every living person on Earth. I didn't go deep into scientific drivers, but because I'm talking to Europeans and everyone is excited about Gaia, I just wanted to point out one slide that compares the performance of LSST to Gaia's performance for three quantities, photometry, photometric accuracy, proper motion accuracy, and trigonometric parallax accuracy. And the main point I want to make is that Gaia and LSST are not competing with each other. They are indeed highly complementary missions. So Gaia goes very, very accurately at bright magnitudes, but Gaia is around 20, 20.5, 20 that's its faint end. And then LSST will push this almost five magnitudes deeper. So another factor of 100 in flux or factor of 10 in distance limit. And it will be well calibrated using Gaia data. And then it will allow you to push from, if you look at turn off stars, for example, in the Milky Way, it will, it will allow you to push the studies from 10 kiloparsecs all the way to the edge of galactic halo at 100 kiloparsecs. So there will be discoveries of stellar streams, of many runaway stars perhaps from the galactic center. We, with our Lyrae, will reach out halfway to Andromeda galaxy to maybe three or 400 kiloparsecs tidal radius of the, of the Milky Way. So there will be lots of very good things that we can do by combining these two surveys. So it's very complementary. So going back to the observatory. So observatory is in Chile. It's uh, just a few hundred meters from Gemini South on a peak called Cerro Pachon. These blue lines show our fiber optics connections to the US. So it's redundant, two redundant lines, one going on the west side of South America and the other one through Brazil. They both connect in, in uh, Florida, in Miami. And then I, on this slide, I still have the National Center for Supercomputing applications in close to Chicago in Illinois, but the new decision, the decision for the new data processing center has been made and it will be in uh, at Slack laboratory next to Stanford University in uh, California, the same place that developed our camera. And then there will be satellite processing centers. This slide shows the French site in Lyon, but there will be probably also one in UK. So let me now play, it's a minute and a half long movie that summarizes, summarizes how far we got over the last decade or so. Together with music, it's quite entertaining. So I thought I would spend a minute on showing you this little video clip. You can see how the observatory is growing on the left. We do have our own Air Force. We purchased two drones. And those drones are making these uh, shots from above the observatory. On the right hand side, you can see our auxiliary telescope dome growing. Now it's done. 
So there we will be observing spectroscopically bright stars to constrain the atmospheric transmission that will be used to photometrically calibrate the main survey data. Sometimes we do get snow at the summit. It's close to 3,000 meters. And you can see now Gemini south in the background and behind it, sorry, telescope. Uh, all right, so that's how it looks today as of a month ago. You can see Italian flag on top, Forza Italia. The reason is that uh, an Italian company produced the dome. So what you see above the above the main building that was all assembled by Italians and when it was done then we had little celebration and that's why you see Italian flag between Chilean and US flags. So here you can see the last step in assembling the telescope mount assembly that uh, crane on the left was the largest crane in Chile at that time. It's gently putting down the top and assembly onto the rest of telescope. Here is another shot from inside the dome. So this telescope, as you can tell, it's very short, it's very squat, and that's by design because it needs to be able to, to slew and settle in only five seconds. The camera itself is also impressive piece of technology. It is the largest astronomical camera ever produced. It already made it to the Guinness Book of Records. You can see our former project manager, Nadine, on the left. She was 165. And it's, uh, you can tell how large is the camera compared to the typical human. So for our younger colleagues, if we had any of our grad students dialing in, I, I wanted to show this slide because it tells you how in practice we make complicated instruments. You basically separate them into smaller simpler pieces, still complicated, but less complicated. And then these magic numbers in front of the name of each piece, they are so-called WBS, work breakdown structure number. And then for each of these pieces, you have a team that, that does it. Like for example, here these filters in the middle, filter exchanger, that was done in France. And then in front of it, shutter was done in Germany etc cetera, etc cetera. cryostat was done in slack some other electronic species were done at harvard the brookhaven lab so you have highly specialized groups that take one of these wbs elements and then focus on it so here is the most interesting part of the camera this is for plane and you can see now how to make a camera with 3200 megapixels 3 gigapixel basically it's modular design so each small blue square, it's one 4K by 4K CCD, 16 megapixel CCD. And then each red square has nine CCDs. That's what we call raft. You can see them on the right-hand side of the picture. And these rafts are essentially, essentially autonomous cameras. They have nine CCDs with all the needed electronics underneath CCDs. And you can plug and play them. They are replaceable. So. We have few spares in case that something bad happens, we can quickly replace one route by the other. And here is the camera, the focal plane about a year and a half ago. So that was in the middle of the process of inserting raft in the focal plane. It takes almost a whole day to insert one of those rafts because tolerances are at the level of few tens of microns. Here it is when it was completed. So these corner chips are used for wavefront sensing and for focusing. You can see one of them is slightly out and the other one slightly in. These are focus chips. And here is one of the first images obtained with the camera. So it was pinhole camera, that's Vera Rubin. And the basic point of this image is that all CCDs work. Few of them have some dark marks. So each CCD has 16 amplifiers, 16 segments that are read at the same time so that we can enable two arcs, two seconds readout time. And out of those 3000 something amplifiers, only three are dead. So it's 99.9% .9 success. And 
it's hard to appreciate the resolution of this camera because your eyes, if I show you an image like that one of, of Vera Rubin, the resolution that you have is many, many hundreds of pixels. So in order to display image from LSST at a resolution that would be commensurate with your eyes, one arc minute. So three pixels equal one arc minute that your eyes can re resolve. You need a whole building. So this would be display. It would be 1500 high definition televisions put in this geometry in order to display one LSST image in its full glory. And if you want it now to look at all LSST data, then if you have 30 frames per second to look at everything that LSST will contain, it will take you 11 months. And that was the motivation for the title of my talk, The Greatest Movie of All Time. And within camera, I just wanted to add two slides about useful astronomical information. So we will have two types of CCDs. One is E2V factory from UK, the other one is ITL from Arizona. The basic reason is that neither vendor could produce all CCDs on time, so we went half and half. On the right, you can see differences in their QE. It's not a big deal because differences in their QE are smaller than the variations of throughput due to different air mass and different atmospheres when you observe. So we have to be able to calibrate this anyway. And on the other hand, it may even become useful one day for cosmology to tease out systematics because you can split your data into one chip and the other chip and see if they imply the same conclusions, scientific conclusions. And here is it uh, convolved with filters, weighted by filters. There are six filters that are very similar to SDSS system and for the same reasons because we wanted to separate stars from quasars. We wanted to enable photometric redshift for galaxies. The only significant difference to compare to SDSS is that we split SDSS Z band into two bands, what we still call Z and then Y band. So our Y band goes all the way to the silicon limit at 1.1 micron. So we go slightly redder than SDSS did. And that enables us, for example, with high redshift quasars to push to about redshift of seven while SDSS was done at 6.1 or 2. All six filters were procured. You can see that they are not your typical astronomical filter. They are about 70 centimeter in diameter. They are all delivered and they are waiting to be shipped to Chile together with the camera by the end of this calendar year. So let me now tell you a few words about software. So we will not just produce images. Our requirements for the observatory are that we need to enable science. So when these images will be fully calibrated, then once per year we will produce catalogs just like other surveys do. But we will also have processing in real time. So every 60 seconds, uh, sorry, every 40 seconds and 60 seconds after image was taken, we will publish alerts. We will publish everything that changed on the sky compared to the average image from previous observations. And so because of this, we have quite exquisite software development effort. We have close to 100 people working on software for now close to a decade. It's several million lines of C++ and Python. And so that leads us to to this situation that is best summarized by this cartoon that I like to show. And I paraphrased the American president, John Kennedy, by saying, ask not what data you need to do your science, ask what science you can do with your data. Meaning that there will be this giant database that will be built using 100 petabytes of images turned into catalogs. And so with this database, you don't need to go to telescope anymore. And everyone from everywhere, from US, from Italy, from Croatia, from wherever you want, will be able to log in that database and do same astronomy as anyone else. It will be only your level of preparation and your imagination and your dedication that will determine how far will you get with this input data set. So it's a very significant change of paradigm in astronomy. It leads to further democratization of astronomical science. And 
I'm, I'm excited about that part in particular. My plan is to go enjoy the Adriatic Sea after construction is done and do science from one of Croatian islands by logging into the database. So there will be three types of data products that we will have access to. So prompt data products are those that are designed to enable real time domain science. So after 60 seconds of camera readout, these images will flow to the US, to California. They'll be processed, subtracted from previous images, and everything that is found in different images will be reported into a web stream called alert stream. And once per year, there will be data releases with the best calibrated data that we have. And so details of all the tables, all the database schemas, if you are interested in, all that that is available in this description of data products document linked to the bottom page. And in addition, and unlike surveys to date, you will also have ability to bring your software to your to our data processing center. So we will try to do all the processing that is of general value, steps that everyone would have to do, whatever science they do. But then there will be types of data processing that will be highly specialized and we are not going to do it. Like, for example, you wanted to model spiral arms in spiral galaxies, or you wanted to look for stellar streams using astrometry and colors as input, etc. So these highly specialized science driven steps will not be done. And then if you want to do them, you don't have to download 100 petabytes of data to your home computer. Basically, you will access our data set using say Jupyter IPython notebooks, you will test that all works, and then you'll ask for time on our computer center, just like you would ask for time on a telescope. And then if you have a major amount of processing, like months of processing, you may be awarded such time. Our software is quite complicated. So here is just symbolically, you have raw data, metadata, calibration data coming in, external catalogs, like for example, Gaia catalog. And and then we are producing data releases, co-edit data, we find objects, measure them in co-edit data, and then you get also this nightly alert stream. As part of nightly processing, you will also have orbits for all newly discovered asteroids. And just to give you a feel for how things will be changing, today there are about a million known asteroids with orbits, and for most of them, you know their orbit, but photometry is really lousy. There are maybe a few tens of thousands of asteroids with good optical photometry. With LSST, within two years, we will discover two or uh, six million asteroids. So we will increase the sample size by factor of six or so. And by the end of the survey, on average, these objects will have two to three hundred observations per object in six bands. So it will be it will be very different data set than what we have today. And then when you unpack our image processing pipelines, there are about eight logical steps. And on the right in particular is the, the new way of processing data in real time. It's similar to if you're familiar with Zwicky transient facility, which is ongoing and producing very exciting time domain science. So ZTF is the best precursor to LSST. They have very similar cadence, very similar idea of what to do, except they are smaller telescopes, so they are about, about four magnitudes shallower than LSST will be. Here is an illustration of what those pipelines on the right do. So there are two images, you subtract them. If there is no change on sky, you get background noise with no objects. But if, for example, there is an asteroid that appeared or maybe cosmic explosion, then you will find it in different image and then you report it to the web and then everyone who has facilities for follow up will presumably follow the most interesting objects. There will be lots of them. So per, per one observation every 40 seconds, it's few thousands, about 3000, it becomes about 3 million on average per night or 10 billion over 10 years of LSSD. And now let me go towards closing the talk. Let me tell you a little bit about schedule and how you can prepare for being an effective user of LSSD data. 
This is from our all hands meeting. This is uh, our team from 2019 in Tucson, where our headquarters is. And as of course, you know, COVID came and then all the meetings became Zoom meetings and things were significantly delayed. For example, we couldn't get our Italian company to come to Chile to complete the dome. We couldn't get our Spanish company to complete telescope mount assembly. So we did incur about 19 months of delay. So because of that, our schedule shifted to, to compared to schedule from pre-COVID era. So right now we think that next year we should get first light first with smaller engineering camera and then with the large camera that I showed you. And then in 24, sometime in 2000, 2024, we expect to be done with commissioning, declare construction is over and start regular LSST observations. Of course, this is assuming that there will be no new strains of COVID after Omicron. If there is another strain, then any further delay would have to be added on this schedule. But we are hopeful that things are becoming going back to normal. And if, they, if Omicron is the last serious strain, then we expect this schedule. Another interesting thing on this slide is in the bottom right, those uh, diamonds with names DP01, DP02, DP1, DP2, DR1. They are data releases. DP stands for data preview and they're based on simulations, the first two, 0, 1, 0, 2, and then data preview one will include our commissioning camera data, and DP2 will include commissioning data. DP2 will be serious business. Here is a summary of what we plan to do in commissioning. And so these green rectangles summarize our science validation surveys. It will be two months worth of data with our main camera. It may not sound as a lot, two months, but it's equivalent to dark energy survey, for example. And so you will have access to this data as early as summer 2024. Data preview 0 0.1, which looks like our science platform, that's the data access platform. It has most of quantities computed, most of tools are there, and it's based on simulated LSST data. So even data look like LSST data, similar depth, similar object counts. You could start developing your software for analysis if you wanted to. There is also a large number of IPython notebooks that tell you how to do certain aspects. Like for example, let me compare photometry from today to photometry from a month ago, see how well we are doing, etc. Let me make color color diagrams. Let me match it to some other catalog, etc. And the new reprocessing of the same simulated image data set called Data Preview 0.2 will become public sometime this summer of this year. So here is the whole schedule for data previews and data release. So the most important message I can give to you is that first real data is are expected in the summer of 23. It will be based on our commissioning engineering camera. So this is just around the corner. So if you if you are planning to do serious LSST science, then now is the time to start preparing. Now is the time to start learning to be how to be competitive with others. And so just last two slides. I want to make a point that playing with LSST data, doing science with LSST data will be hard. It will be hard because not only it will be huge data set, but it will also have very precise measurements and then you will be able to do things that you can't do with regular data sets, studies in highly multidimensional space. So here is a list of when my statisticians, my colleagues who work in statistics ask me, so why is it going to be hard? This is expressed in their language in the language of statistics. So it's huge data set, the huge numbers of objects. When you tell them we'll have billions of objects, they, they think that it's my accent that I meant millions, not billions. And they said, no, no, it's really billions because they usually play with data sets that are maybe thousand objects or so. And then with time series data, of course, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of books to buy in time series data. 
but large majority of them are engineering books where they assume regular sampling. Once you go to astronomical time series with irregular sampling, then it becomes a much harder problem. Then often in computer science, in statistics, they assume all errors are the same, that they're homoscedastic. But in astronomy, of course, the fainter is the object, the larger is the error. So we have heteroscedastic errors and sometimes truncated and sensor data. So there are lots of things that are hard. And if you think about what would you want to do with the data set, so just for a moment, think of one observation we make. So we measure maybe hundreds of parameters for that object, but let's just say it's 10 independent parameters. And then we have about 1,000 observations over 10 years. So let it be 10,000 numbers. For each object, it's underestimate, but let it be 10,000, so it's a round number. So if you want to make a diagram, it's not anymore your U minus B, B minus V, color, color diagram in two dimensions. You actually have 10,000 dimensions to construct your, call them diagrams. And that space is populated by 40 billion points. So now that is hard. So we do know how to do this in say three dimensional space with million points. And that's what this plot in the left summarizes. There are some objects, they, they don't occupy randomly and equally the entire space. It's not ergodic, but they are clusters, they are morphologies. And so what you want to find out is how to recognize their clusters. How do you classify objects into those clusters? You can see this question mark that symbolizes unusual objects, so-called outliers or anomalies. How do you find them? So we can do all that today, but we cannot do it easily if dimensionality of your space is 10,000 and if you have 40 billion points to do. You just can't do that at once. So we'll have to be clever. We'll have to design new ways of doing this. And that's one exciting direction for developing tools that will be applied to LSSD dataset. So I will stop here again. You can find all these slides in that link, R22. There is a paper in AppJ about 40 pages long where there is much more about science drivers and design of the system and what to expect. And so the thing to remember is that LSST will be the greatest sky survey ever and that it's about to start. We think it will start in 2024. So I will stop here.